Welcome to the Geoeconomics Podcast. I'm your host, Alexa Pomazovich, and today I'm speaking with Nolan Myers. Nolan is the CEO of Double GDP, who are developing end-to-end digital solutions for cities. More on that in the conversation. Um, I think this episode is going to be extremely useful for people who are leaders and entrepreneurs in their own right, but haven't been able to make inroads in the SEZ and charter cities space, because specifically what we talk about is cities as systems and, ha- and how different parts of that ecosystem can be serviced by outside entrepreneurs. So we're looking at sort of the buy side of these exciting and new city projects. So uh, without further ado, here's Nolan. And here I am with Nolan. Nolan, how are you doing today? I'm great, Alexa. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me what the name of your company, Double GDP, means. I understand it's gross domestic product, most likely, but can you tell me more about it? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for asking. Uh, Yeah, Double GDP literally means that our mission is to double the world's GDP. We were founded, inspired, I guess, by uh, an economics paper that argued that if you could allow anybody in the world to move to whatever city was their choice, just by opening up migration, you would have the uh, capability of doubling the economic output of the world, adding $80 trillion. And we decided that there were so many barriers to international migration that would make that the achievement of that kind of vision impossible, but much more possible would be to allow great cities to grow up in every location around the world. So if you could have thousands of new cities being formed, and if these could be great places to live, work, and play, that would have the same kind of effect of giving everybody in the world a great opportunity to have a good city to live in, and therefore uh, achieve that uh, same idea of doubling the world's GDP in a slightly different way. That makes sense. Uh, So how would one go about uh, increasing people's, you know, governance and uh, doing business and all of these aspects of uh, what it is that makes cities viable? Uh, How do all of these things get increased by what it is that GDP, uh, double GDP is doing? Because, you know, you just mentioned that uh, if everybody could choose their own jurisdiction and uh, area they do business, uh, we'd see a massive wealth increase. Now, obviously, that's not realistic. But uh, what do you think is possible in the world that we're in? What kind of services can make these types of uh, growths happen, specifically what can result in cities flowering, as you just uh, described? Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about uh, you talk about governance, and I think that governance is extremely important. And I think also to many in your audience will be uh, familiar with the ways that governments uh, governance can affect uh, the quality of the city. Um, we're also looking at sort of the the services behind it. I think one of the things that fascinates me is that you know, in the last twenty odd years, uh, we have seen the way that information technology, the internet, and phone-enabled apps have just totally transformed the way the private sector delivers services to its customers. So for instance, when you log into Amazon, you you know they know who you are and they have a complete history of the orders that you've that you've had and they know how to provide services to you. Same with Uber. You know, you call for an Uber and you can see the car coming to you. That same kind of transformation has not yet come to governments. And so this would not necessarily be governance in the sense of uh, of the laws themselves, but really how those services are delivered. And so what we're thinking of is a a new city platform, uh, an operating system, if you will, that allows the city to deliver services much the same way that we're already expecting in the private sector. So it looks to me like this is sort of a gold rush scenario, if I can use the tired old metaphor. And uh, in this sort of parallel, the services that uh, you guys would would be offering is something like the uh, like the proverbial uh, shovels to the uh, to the gold <laughs> miners. And uh, what I'm thinking about is just how uh, software and how uh, user experience can completely paint the way that uh, that some of these governance institutions uh, be, get perceived. For example, when uh, myself and a couple of business partners were visiting Rwanda, we had the pleasure to use their uh, Irembo platform, which is a very interesting digital governance platform that uh, I've not had the experience of using anywhere else. They were able to provide us with access to a national park. Uh, If we wanted to, we could pay parking tickets, just all sorts of stuff was available through national level platform in Rwanda. Uh, I was wondering if uh, this, if it's one specific instance of a government's, uh, of a governance service platform uh, like Irembo that you guys are pursuing or is it more of an uh, or is it more of a ruby on rails 
type thing, like a, ba a back end that allows different governments and different, uh, you know, governance providers to uh, build up their uh, user experience digitally, uh, like Irembo. Yeah, great, very insightful question. I like the uh, I like the gold rush analogy and the providing of the shovels. Uh, I think that there is a lot of sort of the mundane tools that city administrators need to be successful, and I think that a big part of what WDP is trying to provide is take care of the stuff that. Um, should be mundane, but is actually not, that is actually very difficult today, but that because we've seen it work so well in the private sector is uh, is actually diff is sort of user expectation, but the cities today don't have the capabilities to deliver. So for instance, we, we coin ourselves an end-to-end -end platform for new cities to connect with residents, accelerate growth, and deliver responsive public services. And I think at the core, what that looks like to an end user is, uh, is a mobile application or a mobile friendly application that is branded from the city's perspective. So it looks like you're logging into, um, we're working with a, a city in Zambia named Nkwashi. And when residents of Nkwashi log into the app, they think they're logging into the Nkwashi app. And so for them, for the residents, it is a one-stop shop for all of the things that they need to do, all the interactions that they have with the city from accessing the gate to seeing what events are going on, to having a map of the city, to seeing the latest news, even to paying their, their um, rents or their mortgage. On the back end, it does uh, look, uh, I'd say, more of that, that back end sort of idea of the Ruby and Rails that you talked about. I mean, it comes with an interface, of course, but it is an interface that all administrators in the city can log into and see uh, what those you know, what is going on. So they can message with the existing residents. They can see a sales channel of who's interested in buying what properties and being able to help advance those deals. They can put out marketing messages. They can see who's been visiting from the gate. So it's the, when I talk about an end-to-end -end platform, the idea is that for the residents' perspective, they have one, one place to go. And on the back end, those administrators also have a single, single place to go that takes care of their day-to-day -day work that's involved in delivering services to the residents. So I'm not necessarily sure about the number and the research on this, and you might not be either, but uh, I'm just curious, uh, how much of world GDP is accounted for by just governance services, municipal services, and similar, uh, similar level things that would be uh, unlocked? through this user experience. Um, I'm thinking that uh, if everybody were able to contact their uh, you know, municipal trash or uh, water or whatever infrastructure, uh, it would make their uh, living in any given uh, neighborhood significantly easier and uh, thereby increase their wealth. So I'm just wondering, like, do you happen to have that number by hand? Yeah, I don't have that number, but I think that's a tiny fraction of the value that I'm, I'm thinking of being created, right? I, I think there's, there's marginal gains. Well, I think there's substantial gains for the city administrators themselves in terms of the efficiency of those services delivered. What excites me more is the possibility of creating new cities that are actually run better. And the aggregate effect of having those new cities often running in these special economic zones that you know that you know so much about, right? I think you combine the idea of a very well-run city, putting that into a special economic zone that has uh, some tax advantages or has some unique geographic advantages that that city can then uh, build upon. And that's actually what creates, uh, that's what creates the GDP. It's the agglomeration of people into effective and efficient places to live. I see. So it's, it's a bit of a zero to one versus one to N uh, dichotomy, if I can borrow from uh, from the Peter Thiel book. That's really interesting to me. So Nikwashi, for example, and we'll have the link to it in the description, is a project that I uh, that I know as a, as a residential project primarily, but uh, the residential aspect of it is actually really important. There's a massive migration towards cities worldwide. I think Africa and uh, and Asia are going to be the biggest, for lack of a better word, culprits in uh, in that trend. So I'm just wondering if those are the sort of areas that you guys, uh, Double GDP, are uh, primarily targeting. Yeah, interesting. It's it, it's interesting to hear your frame of uh, Nkwashi as a residential project. And and while I think that might you know, that may be true, I think the notion of a new city is actually broader uh, than that. And I think what you have are different flavors of new cities, actually. I think there are sort of different reasons for a new city existing. And actually, I think one of the 
One of the um, things I heard on a previous podcast of you is a sort of every, every city needs to find what its unique competitive advantage is. So in Nkwashi's case, they're thinking of education as one of the primary things that gives them a unique advantage and they're planning to build around a university. But it's not strictly residential. It has, it's a mix, it's planned as a mixed use development that will have a central business district. It will have residential, it will have a university center. And then they do have, I believe that they certainly have agriculture and I do believe they have some industrial planned. But other cities we've talked to may they have more of a, of a leaning for, for um, industry uh, and uh, may have a slightly different take on what their sort of critical advantage is based on where they happen to happen to be. What I find interesting is that these, um, these different cities all have a similar kind of bedrock of need around the use cases that I consider to be what the operating system is. So if you think about the analogy of an operating system, there may be many, many applications that are running on an operating system, but they're all making use of some of the same core functionality, right? Or the same way of interacting with that hardware layer. So what is that, in, in my mind, that core functionality, this sort of core you know, spirit of what, a, what an operating system needs to provide that will allow Nkwashi to be successful or Ciudad Morasan in Honduras or any other city that's, that's thinking about these kinds of tech platforms. That sort of core use case, I would say, starts with just a registry of all of the people, the entity and the land that is taking place there and how those things come together to create, uh, to create value. Yeah, I mean, it just looks like, speaking of value, there just seems to be an infinite number of things that are necessary for a city to succeed. And none of them individually is, or even together, uh, are sufficient to make the city successful. I can name you like hundreds of uh, hundreds of cities and special economic zones that have all the necessary accoutrement, like, you know, internet and infrastructure and special jurisdiction. And uh, even for, ma for many of them, uh, an economic an economic value proposition that's, uh, that's somewhat unique, but uh, still there doesn't, uh, this seems to be a kind of special sauce that uh, that most cities can capture but what i what i further think about is that it doesn't really matter if you uh, if you capture that special sauce or not you can still create a lot of value and uh, and improve people's lives just by creating these just by creating these projects that uh, that simply do everything that they're uh, that they're supposed to and uh, i'm thinking that back to the uh, back to the shovels analogy uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of business that can be gained for uh, people who are adjacent to the charter cities slash special economic zone space, which is uh, just now nascent. So I'm thinking that in the next 10 years, this space is going to grow massively. And uh, there's a massive number of, uh, of industries that are going to grow uh, as adjacent to uh, to the to the zone industry itself. So uh, obviously yourself, you're in the uh, you're in the software angle of, uh, of things. Uh, how many different verticals would you say exist in just the software angle? You said something interesting about the special sauce that cities can't capture. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then I'll come into the, the question of verticals. The you know, we talk about that special sauce, and I think the, here's where the analogy to the gold rush and the shovels might be a little limiting, right? I think while while shovels are very important, I think one of the things that's critical to forming a new city is what we like to talk about as coordination problems. How do you get the mix of capital and intellectual energy and uh, land and people moving to happen all at the same time or just right around the same time? And this is where I think the value of an integrated system and having one operating system that has access to a little bit, if not all of what's going on in each of those areas is actually so valuable and why I think we can help accelerate growth for new city, new cities. The In a coordination problem, it's a, lot, it's a lot about timing. It's about connecting an opportunity, uh, co connecting with supply and de demand, being aware that that there is an opportunity over here that is interesting to somebody over uh, on the other side and being able to pull them together. Well, in the way that a traditional tech stack works for a city or the way, and let's say even above the tech stack is the departments of a city. It's very common you have a finance department and you have an operations department and you have a marketing department. And each of these right, right now is running on their own tech stack. And so of course the coordination, if there's an opportunity that one of those uh, departments finds, it, would, it may never be discovered or be made aware of to another one of those departments. Having that all into the same system means that you can very quickly connect the dots between um, between one and the other. You know, I was inspired a little bit about what Ainsley Brown said in, in a previous podcast that you had about 
the challenge in Jamaica of adapting to the to the COVID industry and some rolling out some new regulations for for um, the BPO industry there. And uh, imagine, right, if you have this coming from the health department, the latest information is that, hey, we need to adjust to this new COVID situation. We don't even really understand what it is. But what we want to do is ask all BPO businesses to comply with a new uh, regulation about the space uh, in between or having or, or having uh, barriers in between the different desks. If you had a good business registry of what all of those were, you could imme- you could just write one query, pull them all up and say, here's all the things. I want to add one step to that business registry process. You say this new step is uh, social distance requirements and here here's what they are. And now immediately all you know you roll it out and immediately all of your BPOs are not, uh, are not fully compliant, and they all have a new task in their inbox. And over time, over you know the course of a couple of days, several of them log in, they understand what it is, you can see that they're making some progress, they say, yes, I'll be compliant by this date, and you can manage that entire process, and then follow up with the laggards to make sure that you have enforcement and, and, and do that. And so being able to connect the, the different departments and the different um, challenges that, a, that a, a, a given city might have, um, is what helps solve that coordination problem. And I think you see similar problems in the marketing of of bringing in new residents. I think you see similar kind of coordination problems, even in the financing of the city, right? You get one investor interested, uh, other investors are interested at the same time. So that's where I think that having sort of an integrated system uh, really works. So what you just mentioned about uh, one investor leading to the next and sort of this domino effect uh, immediately makes me think of power laws and power distributions, meaning that there's, you know, one major, uh, one major actor, and then a bunch of uh, a bunch of small ones. So what I'm thinking of is uh, is consolidation in the uh, in the charter cities slash SEZ industry. Uh, do you see that as something that's uh, do, do you see it as an industry that's going to be mercurial and very difficult to grab a high uh, high stake over? Like it's some market share is constantly going to be shifting left and right? Or do you think it's going to be an Amazon type situation where uh, a unified player is going to be able to consolidate the market and be uh, sort of in control of things? Not necessarily just, you know, cities. I doubt it. That I doubt that everybody's going to move to one, uh, you know, to one massive city like Dubai or Shanghai or whatever. But what might happen is that the city OS uh, might become the next uh, the next Amazon or uh, the so, some other ancillary part of the city's industry might become, uh, might become the next big consolidator and uh, and mega corporation right so i'm just wondering what you think about uh, about consolidation in the uh, in the sec industry well, I, I certainly think there's a lot of advantages to having a, a, a platform that is common a lot among many different cities. And, you know, obviously, Double GDP is hoping to provide that kind of platform uh, that will um, provide that benefit. I don't know. I, you know, we're, we're so far from, <laughs> from uh, owning, owning that whole market that I think it's, it's, it's not even worth sort of going down that path. What I think is interesting, though, is I think that, the, that fundamentally there are many shared cases between all of these different new cities that we're seeing kind of regardless of where they are. What does every new city need to do? It needs to sell land. It needs to be able to attract people to that land. It needs to be able to attract investment. It needs to be able to run processes efficiently. It needs to have a registry. All of those are things that are just very, very common. And yes, there are there are variants, variations on a theme that different cities need to run. But I think that, that providing this platform to multiple cities uh, not only allows double GDP to achieve some, um, some commonality in the way that it's services, but I think that actually seeing that there are relatively common practices that all cities can learn from each other will help create a community of innovators that are that want that have a shared vision for creating a great place to, to live, work, and play. I also think that, you know, coming to your earlier question about the verticals and, and the software angle, I think the, you know, one of the things that's fascinating about the emergence of the, of the tech industry, you know, kind of the startup industry in, in my lifetime is seeing the way that platforms have allowed innovation and and entrepreneurship to flourish. So when I first started my career, in order for a startup to get going, they had to buy all the hardware for the servers. And I remember my first company, we had two different server locations because we wanted to have server farms, if you will, because we wanted to have redundancy. And uh, they were co-located in different places and each one had two different connections to the internet. And the amount of capital, it took hundreds of millions of dollars to raise the amount of capital that was necessary to run a a company, a a software company. Today, those companies are founded, you know, you can found a company with $2 million and sometimes even less because 
AWS provides all of that same thing where you just rent only the hardware that you need. And so while I think that double GDP will provide an operating system like AWS or provide some shared services that every city needs, I think there's also many, many verticals that then can grow up in the city space that will be providing services to uh, to the cities that, that would be third-party apps that may interact with the APIs that double GDP makes available. You know, so for instance, let's say that a city chose to make certain information about its businesses and about its its uh, residents available and its residents' interests available. Third-party apps could use some of that data, aggregated or depersonalized, in a way to help them to figure out what services are needed or where those services would be. And it just allows third-party apps to come in and, and create verticals that we haven't even, we may not even have, have thought of today. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's... Uh... It's a weird thing to consider that uh, cities are going to become sort of these meta products that are going to try to hold on to their uh, acquire and retain their uh, their tenants, as it were. And then uh, through doing that, they're going to uh, they're going to begin competing. And now, you know, depending on your uh, depending on your view of what the city's industry is going to uh, become, what type of uh, what type of good it might be a club good, it might be a, it might be something else. But uh, the ways that these cities are going to be competing amongst one another, I think, uh, will lead to different types of prod- of products being uh, in different uh, in different levels of uh, of demand for uh, for the industry. So I'm thinking that uh, something like a city OS uh, significantly lends itself to uh, to universal uh, universal acceptance because if everybody uses the same payment processes like Visa or uh, the same uh, the same city OS like uh, like you just mentioned, uh, that will increase the network effects of these cities amongst one another and uh, and sort of increase the uh, the wealth and the value proposition. So I'm wondering now uh, of all of these network effect products. Uh, City OS being one of them. Uh, what do you think are the uh, main ones to focus on? Is it stuff like uh, immigration? Is it stuff like uh, municipal and tax payments? Uh, just fr- from the most zoomed in view, what's the uh, minimum viable product that's going to open up this uh, this software vertical for uh, for what we're looking at? Uh, great question. And I, I first want to uh, add a big plus one on the this notion of acqu- acquiring and retaining tenants uh, as being critical to city success and, and having competition there. Uh, I think that's absolutely the, the, the world that we're moving into where cities are competing for human capital and, uh, and need to start thinking of residents as customers because residents are what's going to bring the ideas that are going to attract other residents and businesses and investors. And, and it's human, you know, cities are in effect uh, agglomerations of human capital. And I think very often we talk about them as the land, but uh, Ed Glazer and his his book, The Triumph of Cities, really sort of uh, hammered home the point that that cities are uh, are actually human capital, and that's the way to think of them. And so I think this this notion of cities competing for the human capital that's going to make them successful uh, is act, is good for the cities, it's good for the uh, for the world, it's good for the people who are living in them. And that's, I think, kind of that, that flywheel that I think is going to lead to uh, doubling the world's GDP. You know, you asked about then sort of the main main ones to focus on, and uh, you asked about immigration and tax payments, and I think those are very, very uh, critical. I think there's a layer that's even more foundational to that, that we that just is very hard today, given today's technology landscape for a new city developer to, to hit. And so I would come to even some more core services, like just having a digital ID of, of every entity in your city, every person. So not just the resident, but the it could be the, the landowner, it could be the renter, it could be the investor, it could be uh, a delivery person who's coming uh, every day into the city. All of those are are customers of the city to some extent and uh, valuable contributors to that overall economy. And I think, so then the other sort of core um, use cases that I think um, every city needs and that I think really can be just that hopefully in five years are just run rate, right? That these are things that every city that we're talking to, every new city just does well and is not even differentiating because Cities should be differentiating on things that are really special or unique to them. Uh, there are certain things that we will that we hope uh, will become just uh, table stakes that every city should provide. And that is, I think, you know, I, I've mentioned the registry, but being able to share updates and notifications. And if something is going on in the city that's a hazard, being able to let everybody in the city know right away, hey, this thing is going on. Um, being able to uh, have a workflow engine on the back end that means that the city is going to 
uh, pull together people from whatever departments are necessary to be able to deliver a quality service to the end user or to the end customer being a resident, right? So a workflow engine, that a task management system. Um, and I think just bilateral communication is, is just absolutely essential. Like, why should you not be able to open up your city app and start a chat with a city administrator and say, hey, you know, I see this is not just a pothole. There's something funny going on here that's more involved. Like, yes, if there's a pothole, you should be able to report that incident. And by the way, that's something even today that's not very well handled by many cities. But but you should be able to chat with somebody if there's something more and get customer support on uh, on hand. Um, those are all things that I think we are just so accustomed to in the private sector that we just don't even realize are not available to us in from, from our cities. And we've grown accustomed to the fact that cities are just not delivering things that we should expect. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the fact that cities don't deliver uh, what we expect makes me think of the latest and greatest revolution in the private sector, primarily the internet revolution and sort of the second generation of internet companies. I'm talking uh, Amazon and Google, for example, Facebook similarly, almost treat their, uh, their users as the product as opposed to the client. And I've had several discussions with people uh, regarding the charter city space that uh, if allowed to uh, run amok, the charter city space will end up leading to a world where uh, these uh, citizens and tenants of cities are not looked at as uh, as valued customers but more of as uh, more of as the product to be uh, to be shipped around and uh, and moved and exploited now what that specifically meant meant uh, in that person's mind i couldn't tell you but uh, i'm sure that there are certain business models that these charter cities could pursue which would lead to populations of businesses and uh, individuals and families and communities uh, being treated in a product like manner so what i'm thinking of is that uh, if you're able to provide a very seamless, uh, uh, a very seamless existence for people uh, in a uh, in a way that uh, doesn't affect their uh, physical lives, and by that I mean you provide a digital governance and exist and legal existence within a city without them necessarily living in the city, that leads to this sort of race to the bottom scenario, and then uh, you're uh, you're forced essentially by fiduciary responsibility to explore other revenue uh, other sources of revenue like uh, you know using your city os app to uh, to advertise to your citizens and then then that might become a major thing with uh, with the boards of uh, of cities uh, and their uh, and their internal governance so i'm thinking about then this is uh, this is going to sort of move into the question uh, what do you think are the uh, business models you know 10, 20 years from now, when this space is sort of matured, that may be perceived as uh, as somewhat negative. Obviously, there's uh, there's a lot of growth that's going to come uh, that's going to come from uh, the charter city space, but um, it's not going to be all uh, all sunshine and rainbows. So I'm just wondering, from your point of view, what do you see as uh, potential systemic uh, changes that may lead to the space being somewhat weird? Well, you know, I think. I think in every every human endeavor, when you are any change has has consequences that are both positive and negative. And I think um, you have you know sometimes there's good intention that comes out wrong, and sometimes there's actually bad intention. Um, I'm really much more focused on the opportunity and the ways that we can improve things. I'm aware that there are risks, and I think that there are things that we need to manage in terms of those risks. One of the big ones that people bring up is privacy. And I think that privacy is, is um, one where the social contract that we have with our technology today is, is fundamentally being rewritten kind of every day. And that's a conversation that I'm a part of and I'm subject to, and you know I'm in that same sea of, of change that everybody's experiencing. And I for, for me, I think what a lot of this comes down to is a, is being transparent about what the expectations of that social contract are so that they can evolve. So I'll give you an example, right? Many people are willing to give up some, some degree of privacy uh, in exchange for better service, right? I allow Uber to know where I am so that they can send a car directly to me and I don't have to type in address. I allow Amazon, uh, I don't even allow Amazon. Amazon always knows my order history with Amazon. Uh, that, is, that is a contract I have to participate in uh, to, to work with Amazon. Um, but I allow them to, to know my order history so that they you know, uh, have a preference engine and, and to some extent so that they can figure out what products to sell and maybe to some extent what products to sell to me. I think the same is gonna be true in the city. I think when you call for security services, you will want the city to know where you are and you'll want to be able to see a car 
you know, on its way to come to come help you. And I think that people are going to be willing to give up some location privacy for that. I think also similar, similarly, most people are willing to have a login to the city and say here, you know, the city should have a history of the conversation that we've had so that whatever agent I'm working with right now on today's topic sees the context and the history of the things that I've interacted with in the city before. I think what's important is being able to talk, is being able to share openly what those expectations are, when and how they are uh, changing. So like, what can you opt out of and what can you opt into? Uh, and, and just making sure that people are aware of, of sort of what social contracts they're signing up for. But I think it's a community by community kind of uh, basis. I think different communities may come to different uh, arrangements of, of what they feel comfortable with. And I'm open to that. Oh, absolutely. And uh, just thinking about the way that uh, most of my peers and, you know, business people that I interact with, just how they perceive governments and the world that they exist in, it's already, uh, it's already significantly changing. Everybody's, uh, everybody's moving more towards a, a globalized equal playing field world. And the way that I perceive cities of this type, how I perceive them affecting that is that they're going to go back into a heterogenized model. And by that, I don't mean that uh, certain cities are going to be, you know, massive, uh, expansive empires or, uh, you know, communist uh, experiments or whatever, but more along the lines of uh, the way that people live is going to be more, uh, more in tune with their, uh, with their immediate surroundings and the, uh, and the networks that they're able to reach on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, si since COVID, the, uh, the work from home and remote work revolution has sort of led to a situation where almost everybody is uh, interacting with people in in a way that's not uh, it, it's not the standard way of interacting with uh, with local communities by going to dinners parties or or whatever but rather this uh, more uh, more nuclearized uh, way of uh, way of interacting i think that cities may be a way for the world to uh, to swing that pendulum back in the uh, back in the other direction do you think that uh, for for cities as uh, as a direction in development that this is uh, that this is trying to achieve something specifically like i just mentioned go go, go more into the direction of uh, of local communities or is it just a logical consequence of uh, of business and people trying to establish more economic growth for themselves is it is is it an emergent uh, property of uh, of the market that these cities are being developed, or is it something that, uh, or is it something that gets uh, that gets designed as uh, uh, as opposition to uh, to the direction the world is going? Clearly, there's a there's a macro trend of of globalized knowledge work in particular, and I think that's something that would, is uh, worth embracing both because it's a reality and because I think there's great opportunity there. Um, you know, one of the most uh, interesting things that we've discovered, I, I mentioned this no notion of a coordination problem. And one of the things that we've been experimenting is how do you get the first residents to move into a city? Um, and uh, that's that's a, a big coordination problem that historically was solved by one major company moving in, you know, hundreds of people all at once. And I think that's still a viable model. But I think there's other models. And we're, we're actually running some experiments within Kwashi around residency programs. So two years ago, we started what's, what's called an artist in residence program with the idea that we would actually house a few artists and provide a living stipend and have them beautify the city, build beautiful sculptures, murals, public works of art that would both attract visitors and make it a better place to live. And then that actually grew into what we now have that's an even bigger program, a hackers in residence program. We've partnered with a, a company called Microverse that has an all remote curriculum. And we're training uh, today, 20 and uh, within a couple of months, 70 hackers who are learning to build software and get all the skills to do that. And also learning the skills to have all remote work because there's a there's a skill set that's involved just in sort of learning how to interact with a teammate teammate in, a, in an all remote manner and what we're doing is we're housing those people at Inquashi so they we're we're actually uh, paying room and board for them right so that they can focus on their studies uh, Microverse is a is a company that allows them to pay after they they, they get a job so there's no money up front for those for those people who are participating in the program, what their commitment is, is to give eight to 12 months of full-time study towards becoming software engineers, and then to land a job that pays well. Now, our experiment is to see, will those people then stay at Nkwashi? Is Nkwashi the place where a new knowledge economy can emerge in Zambia and, and bootstrap? Because every knowledge worker that you have there is now, there's a ratio of knowledge workers to service worker economy that's going to emerge if you're able to get that. So if we're able to get 100 uh, software developers earning 
inter, earning money internationally, right? Earning money by doing work in probably US or European based companies. Uh, but living at Inkwashi, now you've done two things. You've enabled a whole uh, cohort of people to have access to a, a much uh, higher paying job than they would have had access to otherwise. And you're bootstrapping uh, that that problem, that challenge of starting a new city that, that wants to have a, a knowledge economy, especially one like Inkwashi, who's decided that they're sort of critical um, you know, th their anchor tenant is a university and their sort of critical path is to be a knowledge working city. That may not be the best strategy for a city that is an industrial city. They might want to think about an anchor tenant that has a hundred or a thousand uh, workers that they're bringing in. But I think it shows one way in which this globalized playing field can have local effects. And uh, one of the ways that that coordination problem that we're talking about, when you do solve it, can lead to the economic growth that uh, that, that you and I have been talking about. Uh, that's a very, uh, very impressive way of thinking about it specifically, because uh, I recall a book uh, by Giorgio Vasari, a 16th century uh, Italian artist. Uh, the book is called Le Vite, or uh, The Lives, and it talks, it talks about the lives of various uh, Renaissance artists in Italy. And the way that you just explained an artist in residence sort of mirrors the patronage relationship that many of these, uh, you know, uh, city nobles would have with uh, with local artists. So, uh, you know, Lorenzo de' Medici, a famous uh, Renaissance banker, would invite in Leonardo da Vinci to uh, to build buildings for him or uh, otherwise beautify the city. And uh, what it looks like to me, sort of going in the opposite direction of what I mentioned of uh, of citizens becoming the product, uh, it looks like the uh, the star citizens, the knowledge workers, the artists, the, uh, the, the rock star entrepreneurs, they're going to become the prize that these cities are, uh, are looking for. And, uh, you know, I can easily see a future in which uh, these cities will advertise themselves as we are the place where, uh, you know, Elon Musk is doing business, right? And yeah. uh, as a result of that, uh, I think that we're uh, I think that we're moving to a much more uh, Renaissance type uh, environment, uh, as opposed to like you know this is uh, this is from conversations that I've had with people a more bleak cyberpunk corporatocracy uh, type thing. Uh, does that does that sort of res resonate with you? Well, bleak cyberpunk doesn't resonate resonate <laughs> so much, but but I what I was really thinking about is sort of when you think about the history of cities, you know, cities evolved much earlier in human history than, than national governments did. And um, I think that what we could be seeing is a shift back more to that localization. And, uh, you know, we, I, I introduced at the beginning of our podcast, the, the notion of cities as economic engines. I think that is, I think cities are also the innovation engines. That's where new ideas are tried. And I think the idea that you could have one city that's focused on a particular kind of lifestyle and one city that's, that wants to be, you know, the Silicon Valley of Zambia and another city that wants to, to be, uh, you know, I know the Seasteading Institute is creating cities on the water. And I think that's awesome. I mean, I think it's just great that there are um, cities for all, for all walks of life all walks of life of people that are interested in, in doing that. And I think what you'll see is that those cities will, will develop a vibrancy that uh, may be different than the, the national vibe that they're in. And I think we could see those cities. I mean, look, it's always been that, that cities and, and nations have interrelated. And I think, I think we're moving from an, an era or a period where we were very nation centric to an area where we will see more identities coming from cities, right? You might say, oh, I, the first way that you introduce yourself might be, I live in San Francisco, or I live in Nkwashi, or I live in Ciudad Morazan, more so than I, I'm from the United States, or I'm from Honduras, or I'm from uh, Zambia. That immediately reminds me of uh, of a lot of the reading that I've been doing regarding the uh, regarding the classics. If you read uh, Plutarch's uh, Lives of the Greeks and Romans, then uh, the way he introduces people is as you know, uh, Lekimakos from Athens or uh, you know Alexandros from Sparta. Everybody was uh, was associated with the city of their origin, and uh, similarly, a period like that was uh, was the Renaissance, where uh, you know uh, Raphael for a long time was known as Raphael the Venetian because he was active there and. And uh, it's uh, it's quite an interesting development uh, if in the next you know twenty or thirty years uh, we begin going go, going more towards that uh, that way of introducing people of hey this person is active in this community of creators and artists and entrepreneurs uh, rather than this is the registry to which this citizen belongs. Right, so uh, I think it's a really optimistic and uh, and beautiful way of thinking where these uh, where these city developments are going. Thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm, in, I'm inspired that, by that as well, and I, it made me think. I, I think there 
may even be ways that you're already seeing that. You know, uh, Paul Graham is a luminary from Silicon Valley, right? And, and people follow him, but his association is probably, I don't even know where he lives, but I associated him with, with Silicon Valley, which maybe you could, maybe one might argue is not really a city, but uh, that I think is, is analogous to a city in the way that we're talking about things here. The way that we're talking about cities for me is something of a community, but because uh, Double GDP as a company is uh, is treating it as sort of a, a nexus of uh, of goods, services, uh, demand, citizens, all of this stuff. Um, do you think of do you think of cities as a yet untapped technology that uh, that still has a lot to uh, still has a lot to show? For me, it's uh, it's like cryptocurrency. It's like something that we've just barely scratched the surface of. And if it really becomes uh, something that people start studying closely. And, uh, and working on can unlock completely different ways of thinking and working. Yeah, very much. I wouldn't say that they are, um, I guess I wouldn't say yet untapped. I would I would emphasize that they are still operating on a very old model, if you will. Um, there's a, a book that really inspired me called uh, A New City OS, um, and comes out of uh, the Harvard Ash Center. Uh, and it's by uh, Stephen Goldsmith and Neil Kleiman. And I think one of the things that they talk about is that they don't think, that, I, I didn't get the sense that they talk about uh, operating system in the software sense that I that I think of it for double GDP. I think they think of it more as the processes of how the city runs, of how that city administration runs. But I think processes and, and software are are very intricately linked. I think the processes are actually what's what's valuable, right? It's if you, you could have great software, but if nobody's running it and, and using it to deliver services, the software is of no use. But you could have the greatest ideas. On the other hand, you could have the greatest ideas of how a process could run. And if you don't have a software system that allows you to easily implement that kind of process, you're not going to be able to run it effectively. So I think um, I would say it's it's more that uh, cities are a, t a running fundamentally on processes that were designed in the industrial era. When the, to manage large organizations, you had a command and control kind of model where you had to set up departments that were intentionally siloed and each had its own set of paperwork. Okay. And so if you have a department, because that's the way that that department can run efficiently, because you run everything vertically through that department and you have chains of command that are able to sort of manage their smaller and smaller piece. The challenge is that to deliver great service today, you need a little bit from each of these departments, right? To clear regulations on a, a permit for a new building, you might need a little bit of fire inspection and, and some safety protocol. You might need the health, uh, occupational health. You might need some uh, clearance to make sure there's not asbestos or the probably not in a new building, but you get the point, right? There could be like a little bit of time from a lot of different specialties that need to come together quickly and efficiently to be able to make something happen. I think you see similar things with immigration. You see similar things, especially anytime there's an exception to a process, right? Anytime a process process runs 100% the way you expect, you can departmentalize it. But whenever there's an exception, those things can really lead to just terrible outcomes and really painful outcomes for the resident of the city. So what I think is really just sort of how do you bring these cities um, that are maybe running on an, on an uh, industrial uh, industrial era operating system into a modern operating system that allows them to deliver service like the best private sector companies that we have today. That's that's kind of how I, I I would frame that question. So we were looking at uh, episode twenty actually with uh, with Tom W Bell and uh, he's a lawyer and he was talking about uh, you know creating the best legal system possible for a charter city or a special economic zone or whatever. And what you just spoke about really uh, really hits the nail on the head uh, with regard to, you know, you can have the best laws in the world, but if you don't have code that can actuate it, it's uh, it's not particularly useful. But then on the other end, this is something that I'm uh, that I'm curious about. You have various uh, digital solutions that are uh, extremely powerful, uh, but haven't necessarily been written into law. How do uh, how does software get plugged into uh, existing legal systems? Specifically, what I mean by that is, you know, the government has this industrial era system that they have in place for, let's say, cadastral systems. And uh, you walk up to them as a private company and you tell them, hey, we've developed this uh, this private sector, digital, you know, not immutable, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, cadastral system. And we want it to we want to implement that at the national level and mm -hmm. make it uh, make it legally uh, legally viable. Uh, is that something that you've, you've had experience with? Because for me, building up a software solution like that and presenting it to a government and making it uh, making it compliant with the laws and making it sort of the uh, executor of the laws, for me, sounds like it's a 
massive value add. And I'm just wondering if you've uh, if you've had something like that happen. Yeah, I mean, this has been something we've talked quite a bit about, um, specifically around you know when you're operating a city in a special economic zone, uh, you then oftentimes have uh, immigration or customs uh, regulation on top. Uh, as you've mentioned, cadastral systems could be uh, could be a very important use case. One of the things that's uh, that's nice is we were we were talking with one um, city about their their um, uh, business registry process and saying that they want to also make sure that their zone authority in order to they want to have a, a very streamlined efficient business registry process and in order to do so uh, they want their zone authority to have a there's a certain step in the process where the zone authority needs to have a sign off and does that information then need to be propagated into a whole different system that they uh, that the zone authority is going to look at and and sort of port back and forth and uh, my answer is no like why not just give the zone authority a certain set of logins that give them access to the things that they need to do and they use the, the city's same task management system to do that so i think this is a case where the 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 federal bureaucracy in this case was quite happy to say oh yeah we'll just have logins and we'll use the the we'll use the city management system i think there are going to be other cases where that information needs to be more bidirectional or that it needs to work with an integration with a system and everything that we do at double gdp is is built upon a layer of APIs that will make it easy for us to, you know, so I guess we're future proofing in the sense uh, that kind of uh, use case because we want to because we know that the way that the city city interacts with its um, county and national governments is of utmost important to the uh, efficient services of the city. Where exactly that line is going to be drawn, I think is going to vary a little city by city in, in terms of the way that they've uh, had that regulation uh, formed between them and their zone authority or their national government. I mean, cities are just such a fascinating subject for me because they're, uh, they're easily the most complex thing that uh, that humans have made. Maybe not the most complicated, but uh, definitely the most in interoperating uh, individual and eclectic parts to them. With regard to uh, double GDP, uh, you guys are currently working with Nakwashi. Are there any other uh, major projects that you're uh, that you're working on, and are they in any way like significantly different from uh, from what you guys are working on with Nakwashi, or are you trying to sort of expand the same model to other places? Yeah. We're actively working with the Ciudad Morsan in Honduras as well, um, a project by Massimo, and um, learning from several other cities at the moment that uh, I, I don't want to um, talk about publicly, uh, but actively engaged in conversations and learning from and, and uh, excited about uh, some other uh, projects in the works. Um, but those two projects are actually quite different. You know, um, both of them, one of the things that they're you know, trying to establish is, is safety as one of the paramount sort of value propositions that they want to provide. But um, in Kwashi is is uh, starting from education as their sort of critical um, differentiator. And uh, Sirad Morrison is, is talking about uh, housing for workers who are in the area. There's already an economy in the area and they, they're focusing on affordable housing as, as one of their key uh, or one of their very first differentiators and, and um, critical value propositions. And Sirad Morrison is also so they are um, a ZA in, in Spanish or a special economic zone, um, uh, whereas in Kwashi at, at this point is, is not yet uh, administered that way. So that means that with, uh, with Ciudad Morrison, for instance, we're looking at some of their customs and immigration use cases and, and their business registry has some slight different variations from how uh, in Kwashi is approaching it. But there's, a, there's more that is overlapping than there is that is different. I think what's interesting is that you know, we're seeing how this hypothesis of, of a unified platform applies in these two different uh, circumstances. And other than translating one to Spanish, you know, we, we had to internationalize the, the application. But I've been pleasantly surprised at how much is applicable um, there. And frankly, with all of the other city projects that we're talking with, we're finding a tremendous amount of interest in the same, in sort of those core, mon again, this, the core mundane things that should be table stakes for every city, but today are unfortunately not. And to reiterate, those table stakes that you mention, uh, what are they for uh, for cities in general? Oh, just having a registry of all of the people, entities, and land in the city, being able to publish the regulations, notifications, make people aware of opportunities or what's going on in the city, having safety and, and gate access to make sure that you know who's coming and going, having a workflow engine and task management system so that you can keep track of what needs to get done and when, and having a multifaceted community.
communication layer that allows you to interact with your residents. I think that puts a really good bow on this uh, on this conversation. I mean, we've gone uh, over from every everything from uh, Renaissance cities and uh, and city based software to uh, whether or not we're going to go into a evil cyberpunk bleak future and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, if people want to uh, follow what Double GDP is working on and uh, what your uh, what your latest developments are, uh, where can they find you online? Yeah, we're at doublegdp.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Nolan Myers. Awesome. Nolan, are there any uh, other closing thoughts you want to leave our uh, listeners with? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Alexa. I, I really enjoy these sort of far ranging uh, conversations and sort of the, uh, I, I'm appreciative of the breadth and depth that you bring to this conversation and the way that you frame it and just talk about so many different interesting topics within the span of 45 minutes. So thank you very much to you and thank you for allowing me to visit your podcast. And thank you for coming on, Nolan. I also enjoyed the conversation conversation a lot. For our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to help us out with the algorithm magic with the likes and subscriptions and so on. Uh, You can find us on Twitter at GeoEconomicsPod, on LinkedIn as Adrianople Group. Uh, I want to thank you for your time today, and we'll see you on the next one. (laughs) 